few months ago, I found an article on the internet, and it was on leadership. And if there's something the company I work for needs, it's leadership. Um, from top to bottom, it wouldn't matter. And the title of the article was basically, Stay Calm and Be Positive, like when you're in a crisis. And I thought, that's, that's a nice thought and something to keep in mind. Stay calm and be positive. And so I thought it was worthy enough and important enough that I went into the lady that does our payroll, and she has a board on her wall. We all have little boards on our wall. And um, I said, Serena, we're going to write this down because we need to remember this. When we get upset with things or we want to lash out, we need to remember to stay calm and be positive. And so we wrote it on the board. And we've written several things on the board. We've even got Proverbs 3, 3 through 6, you know, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Um, we wrote that up there. And we've got a few other things we have on one side. And so every now and then we'll go in and we'll say, okay, we need to keep this in mind. And... Um, but one thing in the article, as, I, as you read into it, he said that most people will forget 90% of what you, what you say, but they, re, they will remember how you said it. So they'll forget what you said, but they'll remember how you said what they forgot that you said. So this morning, let's try to keep it short keep the tone good, and maybe our retention will be high. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the Bible, the Holy Spirit, and for the opportunity to come and worship this morning. Father, we pray that you would be with us today, that you would lead us and direct us, that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts, our minds, and help us to understand what you would have for us. Help that missing piece to fit just where we need it to go so it begins to make more sense, that our faith will grow. And Lord, we thank you for the many blessings that you have offered to us and you give to us. And we ask all of these things, dear Lord, in your name and for your will to be done above all things. Amen. Frank, that's a whiteboard. Yep. And we are going to whiteboard in church today. Pay attention. All right. The Bible says in Psalms 139, verse 4, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Well, we understand the wonderful part of being created in the image of God. And just a small uh, data fact of our body, the heart pumps approximately five quarts of blood every minute in our body. And it circulates through approximately 60,000 miles of vessels every minute. We are wonderfully made. And we're not going to expound on a lot of uh, bodily facts this morning, but that is one that would emphasize the wonderfully made part. And those who have gone into the medical profession and have studied this out more so than someone like myself, I can only tell you about what it's going to cost if you get sick. I can't tell you how you're going to get well. So I'm a suit, as my wife would refer to the administrative people. And she's not a big suit fan. Because um, they manage by numbers and, and not by touch and feel and, you know, all that other soft stuff. Um, we manage by numbers in the finance world. But anyway, wonderfully made. But what about the fearfully part? It's got to mean something. 
fearfully. Well, the, the Bible says in Proverbs 1, 7, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 8, 13 says, this is an interesting, I, I hadn't read this one in maybe a long time. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. I found that interesting. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And Revelation 14, 7 says, fear God and give glory to him. The first angel of the three angels that we proclaim in these last days. Fear God and give glory to him. The Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. There's a reason for that. We will come back to this in a moment. Hopefully. That's the plan. But in Genesis 1, chapter, I mean, verse 26 and 27, we read, And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over everything that creepeth upon the earth. So God created in his own image, in the image of God, created he him, male and female created he them. Now in this day and age, we need to remember that. When um, some of the little ones will know that when we're in Sabbath school, I say, you are a girl and I am a boy. Let's not mix that up. And God created us, male and female. He doesn't intend for us to go change that because he has a special purpose for how he created us. So, when the Lord comes again, what do you expect to see? But, you know, all the bright angels and all that, that's fine. We're going to see someone that's like, oh, I look like you. You look like me. Created in the image. Image means resemblance in the Greek. So we are created in the resemblance of God. And Psalm 63 verse 8 says, My soul followeth hard after thee, thy right hand. God has a right hand. Do you have a right hand? <coughs> I suppose you have the left hand, but it predominantly refers to the right hand in the Bible. But God has a right hand. We have right hands. We have left hands too. And if you're a left-hander and you can throw fast, you might have a career in professional baseball. Now, Psalms 11.4 says, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes... The Lord has eyes. Do you have eyes? We have two. I suspect the Lord has two. Because the Bible says that he has eyes. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. In Psalms 119.72 it says, The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. The Lord has a mouth. God has a mouth. And we know in Exodus 20, God spoke the Ten Commandments. And we speak with our mouth. So I suspect God's going to have a mouth when we get to heaven. Now Psalms 5.1 says, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Very possible the Lord has ears, just like we do. These are physical characteristics. So when we get to heaven... We're going to see someone, a heavenly being, a holy being, that's going to be similar to what we are. And so, but these are just physical characteristics. There's another feature that's also still a physical characteristic, but it's a characteristic that sets us apart from many other created beings, or um, actually the animal world for sure. And it says, Philippians 2.5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Tracy read that for our scripture reading. So part of being created in the image of God is the mind. And that's why we have the whiteboard. Because there's a few things we want to go through this morning. We have friends that live in Houston. 
and we went to school with them in college there at Southwestern, and we um, lived in Houston with them for a while, and um, no, I'm sorry, they live in Keene now. We went to church with them in Houston, we went to school with them, they were in Houston for a while, then they moved to Keene. Kathy was down there visiting, and they gave Kathy a book, and it's written by a man by the name of uh, Timothy Jennings. He's a medical doctor. Specifically, he has gone on to study psychiatry. Now, I am not a big psychiatry guy. I think it has a flawed foundation, personally. But he, in his uh, medical study, was trying to bring a biblical perspective to the healing of the mind. Because psychiatry deals with people whose minds are not thinking straight. They're off. They're, they just don't think straight or at least according to them. Um, and, of course, when you start trying to define what normal is, that could be a very broad range because we're all different. So, but he says in his book um, that I read most of it, I read enough to get this far, it says, could it be this simple? Because, you know, in psychiatry, they basically want to analyze you and then give you some drugs to correct the chemical imbalance in your brain, generally. So, but he was looking for a different approach to bring to his psychiatric practice. I think the man is an Adventist. It doesn't really say. Um, but he does have some endorsements that come from Adventist institutions, like teachers from Loma Linda. So, he... Um, so I'm gonna, we're going to go through some of this this morning and present just a little bit of what he has to say about the mind and how the mind is set up. And it's kind of interested me and kind of made sense to me because God designed the brain to work in a certain way. And if it doesn't work in the way that God designed, just look around and we have the problems that we have. Why else does someone get up in the top of a hotel and shoot people? The brain's not working right. Why else does a man cheat on his wife? Because the brain's not working right, you see. God did not create those things to be. And so when we get off into areas that are not in harmony with God's word, the brain is not working right. So let's take a few minutes and go through to see how the brain was designed to work. So first, we have God We're over here. Can you all see over here? Oh, no? We have God. He's, he's the creator of all things. And so he created the mind, and the mind resides in our head. Thick skull. Um, and so from the mind, okay, this is a quote out of the book. The highest faculties we possess are those that most directly reflect the image of God ones that many Christians refer to as our spiritual nature and that God intended to govern us. The spiritual nature is not an ethereal, mystical, vaporous entity that enters or leaves our body. It consists of those qualities and abilities that make us godlike, most in his image. They are the traits that separate us from animals and make us accountable to God. So we have the spiritual nature, and you see it's going up because it's on a higher plane. So God created us with a spiritual nature. Now, one of the highest faculties in our mind is the ability to reason. Very important. It helps us to be able to think. It helps us to be able to contemplate and to understand. It's like taking math and you're going through the equation. And you're like, oh, I get that now. That's reasoning, our intellectual power. Now, the animal kingdom does not have the ability to reason. We have a dog, uh, well, we did, Laker, and he passed away a year, a little over a year ago. But he liked to bring things into the front yard, like bones of animals, dead squirrels, and we have seven acres, and Laker could have chosen any of that seven acres to place his treasures. But he loved to place them 
in the front yard by the sidewalk that you would walk by and see as you would go through the front door. And he loved to place them there. And I told Laker, I said, Laker, Kathy doesn't like it when you do that. But he kept doing it. And I would tell him, Laker, you're not supposed to do that. Kathy doesn't like that when you do that. But he would keep bringing it. Laker cannot reason. He did not understand that Kathy did not like that. But see, you and I can understand when something happens and like, don't do that. Oh, okay. I won't do that. But Laker couldn't, he couldn't fathom that because he wasn't created to reason, cause and effect. So he just kept bringing his little treasures and wagging his tail and happy, even though it was annoying people. That's the difference between how God created us and how God created the animals. And in Isaiah 1.18, we are told where Isaiah recorded, Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. This gives us insight into how God wants to deal with us, and more so how he wants to approach us. God is not a dictator. He says, come, let's talk this thing through. Let's reason from cause and effect. Let's intellectually think this thing through. But here's the kicker between man and God. Even though we are created with the ability to reason, we do not have infinite knowledge. We cannot see the end from the beginning. And so due to that, we need something else to help us. And God gave us the conscience to help our reasoning. Because you see, if we just did reasoning alone, we could come up with the theory of evolution, a very intellectual premise. We could come up with Marxism. But yet both of those thought processes, while some consider them very elevated and highly lofted in thought, actually deny the existence of God. So what reasoning are we with? So left alone by itself, it can be dangerous. It could lead us down a path that takes us away from God. So God gave us the conscience to work with our reasoning. And it is through the conscience that would be considered the spiritual eye, as recorded in Matthew 6, 22. And it is through the conscience is where God speaks to us. That still, small voice. You remember Elijah. He was running from Jezebel. Just got off Mount Carmel. Big spiritual high. Killed all the prophets of Baal. Fires down from heaven. Devoured the whole thing. You know, it was a big, a big win for God's people. But Jezebel is after him, so Elijah flees. And he's got the fire, and he's got the earthquake, and the thundering, and all of that. And in 1 Kings 19.12, it says, And after the fire a still, small voice. God says, come, let us reason together. God says, a still, small voice. Revelation 19, no, not 19, 319. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Yeah, this is how God approaches us. Reasoning, still, small voice, stand at the door and knock. If you open it, I'll come in. If you don't open it, I won't come in. He's not going to beat it down. He's not going to break it down to get in. So this is how God talks to us, Holy Spirit working through the conscience. But the conscience has potential to be flawed. And we need the reasoning and the conscience to work together and be in harmony and work in the balance that God created so that we exercise proper judgment. When conscience and reasoning get out of balance, our judgment becomes flawed. And it could lead to decisions that we, sh or actions rather, that, that we should not be doing. So another aspect of the mind of how God created us is worshiping. God created us to worship. And in the Bible, teaches us, admonishes us, that we are to worship God. Now, 
God is not a mega movie star. God is not some sports celebrity that's well known. Some that are known by their first names. Tiger, Michael, LeBron. I mean, we know these people by, I mean, even the casual observer knows. You don't even have to watch it to know they're that famous. But God is not someone who needs our worship to feed his self-worth. But rather, what God knows is, is that we will become whatever we behold. Which is what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3.18. By beholding, we become changed. So if you worship Michael Jordan, you may never make a jump shot like he does. And you may never... But you may start wearing his clothes, you may start wearing, you may start talking like him, you may act like him, um, whatever. You start to emulate whoever you put your affections to. And God knows that if we put our affections to him, that we will reflect his character, which is righteous and holy. So he's given us, we need to worship. Now, the next faculty of the mind <clears throat> is the will. Now the will is where the decision takes place. So while all of this up top needs to work in harmony, we may get to the point where all of this is working properly and we say, no, I don't want to do that. Because the will is the ability to choose, I will accept this or I will not accept that. I will do this or I won't do that. That's where the will comes in. So we must, Ellen White talks about, we need to understand the right action of the will. There is a choice to make. In fact, Matthew 7, 21, maybe, 22, where it says, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father. Well, if you look up will in the Strong's, it means choice. So whoever does the choices that God gives us, which I would believe are coming through the impressions of the Holy Spirit into the conscience of choices to make, should I go to church today? Hmm, that was a choice. And by our, by our presence here, that we can determine that, oh, we must have decided we will go to church today. And so we exercise our free will to come. There were some who maybe exercised their free will and said, nah, I'm not going today. Now, I'm not counting people who maybe are ill or anything like that. That's, that's another matter. I'm talking about people who can actually get up, drive, get themselves out, and go. There are some who said, I'm just not going today. For whatever reason, I'm going to stay home. I'm going to watch 3 ABN. I'm going to, oh, whatever. I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm not going. They exercise the will. God does not force the will because God says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He knocks. He has a still, small voice. He's not going to force the will. He's going to ask us, What would you like to do? But he's not going to force us. Okay, now, following in his chain of command, because there is a chain of command here, then we have thoughts which are beliefs, our values, our morals, our imagination. Now, beliefs are not, the process, are not the foundation that we should make decisions on. I believe this to be true. Our decision-making needs to be higher. This is why they're down a little lower. Because we have had evangelistic series over the years, and people have come to us with one understanding, they have learned a different understanding, and some have changed what they believe. So beliefs alone is not enough just to make decisions, because we can change our belief system. It needs to be rooted in a higher level of thought, and we'll get to that. Then we have feelings. Oh, feelings. That's, a, that's an interesting one. The uh, desire for relationships and affection. God created us with that. But you'll notice it's, it's at the bottom. Because we don't necessarily want to make our decisions based on how we feel. Because we'll probably get in trouble. Because if we ignore some of the other things up above, it may lead us into trouble. Especially in relationships. And um, 
You know, it's like, well, he's such a nice boy, you know, um, but he doesn't have a job and he's lazy, and, but, but he likes me. You know, we're ignoring some of the things up top. You know, is he going to be able to support me? Does he love his mother? Does he treat his mother good? You know, can he hold a steady job? Can he stay out of jail? You know, I mean, but he loves me. Oh, yeah, he makes me feel good when I'm with him, when he's out of jail, you know, or when he's got a little money, but he doesn't work. I mean, so, you know, the things, or he's, he's different in a, in a way that, that would be important, and, but we ignore it because of our feelings. So we, we've got to, you know, that's why it's at the bottom can't just, because I remember in middle school one time, I asked my classmate, I said, why did you do that? He said, well, I felt like it. I'm like, ooh. Um, and so even at work, there are times when my emotions take over, and I'm like, let's fire that person right now. Let's just do it. But then you back up and you realize, oh, wait a minute. You can't. That's an emotional decision. That's not grounded in any higher level thought process. So you back up. You need to back up. Even though you had the thought. So this is how Dr. Uh, Jennings presents the hierarchy of the mind and how God created us. This is how he believes Adam and Eve were created. Perfect harmony with God. But something's happened. When Adam and Eve ate the fruit, selfishness entered the world. And there are three aspects of selfishness. Sensualism, materialism, and egotism. These are the rule of the day, and probably to a large degree explain why the world is what it is. And Sigmund Freud, I guess he was kind of the father of psychiatric medicine or something, he calls selfishness is called id. I don't know what that means. I-D. Little I, small d. Id. So where you find self, and then Freud goes on to state, uh, where it is, selfishness, ego shall be. So, here's the foundation of psychiatric medicine. This is why, mostly as Christians, we, we're going to have a, an issue with this, but here's, here's kind of where it comes from. So, this is a quote out of the book. Could it be that simple? As a result, Freudian theory of psychoanalysis involves the process of turning of turning the mind's eye inward and attempting to bring the unconscious id, the ego, into consciousness. So I, someone can explain that later. Where it can be controlled, modified, and changed. In other words, psychoanalysis is the process of focusing one mind on selfish desires, the infectious, destructive, element of the mind with the belief that after such desires come into awareness, a person can make healthy changes. That's the Freudian um, concept of psychoanalysis and what needs to be done. So if we could just become aware of all the bad things we do, we would be like, oh yeah, that's bad. Let's not do that anymore. right or wrong. I'm going to suggest to you that it's wrong. And I'm going to present a case as to why it is. Can we trust our conscience? That's the question. You don't have to answer it verbally, but can we trust our conscience? So whatever I said up to now, doesn't matter. This, from where here on out, is really what's important. Can we trust our conscience? 
It's an important question we need to understand. Can we trust our conscience? Will the conscience always tell us the truth? Now, the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, let's look this one up. Jeremiah. Let me find it here. Jeremiah 17. We'll, we'll put it on the screen here. Hopefully I can. Jeremiah 17. This one's important. Because this is what the Bible says about us. Whether we accept it or not, this is what the Bible says. Jeremiah 17. This is why this concept of looking inside, trying to figure out what's wrong with us, and then, oh, now we know what's wrong with us, now we can change. Here's why this is flawed. Because here, 17, 9, and 10. Here we go. And you've heard this before. This is why this is a problem. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. The heart is deceitful above all things. Well, if the heart is deceitful, how can we trust it? We can't trust something that's deceitful. That's why looking inward, we are not going to be able to totally solve our problem. Now, Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, in the Bible, heart can refer to the emotions, the feelings, but it also refers to the mind, our mind, our head, the thing that God created, he gave us, to reflect his image. And more often than not, it refers to the mind. And more often than not, it's referring to the will, the choices that we make, the frontal lobe where decisions are made. This is where decisions are made. So can we trust our, can we trust our conscience? I believe the Word of God says no, because our mind is deceitful, because we are born carnal. David said that we were in, in iniquity, did my mother conceive me? And so to trust what we think can be, if, if it's not lined up right, can be, can be detrimental. Now, John 14, verse 1. We went through this in prayer meeting the other day. And um, in John 14, chapter 1, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Now, the verses that come right before that, Peter is asked, because Jesus has just made us some, some comments to the disciples that he is about to go away. And they're not going to be able to follow him. And so, God is, I mean, uh, Peter is apparently contemplating that because he misses the the new commandment that God is Jesus gave them about loving others as God has loved us and so the last part of chapter 13 you know Peter's like well Lord why can't we follow you and so in John chapter 14 1 Jesus says let not your heart be troubled Peter now if you look up troubled in the Strong's it means agitated have you ever been agitated surely right yeah been agitated so think about why do I get agitated I for me personally it's it's when something's not working out the way I want it to work out that's why I'm agitated uh, it also means uncertain it implies to some level that Peter was like wait a minute Lord you say we, you're going somewhere but we can't come it implies that Peter was uncertain of what maybe the outcome is going to be, probably for his life, the separation that he was being told was going to happen. I would suggest to you that the reason Peter was troubled, agitated, uncertain, is because he didn't believe what God had told him, or Jesus had told him. Because if we believe what God tells us, we should have peace in our life. Because Jesus says, my peace I give to you. And the Bible says that there's no rest for the wicked. Well, the wicked are the people who don't accept Jesus. 
Well, if you don't accept Jesus, that means you don't believe what he says. Because why would you accept somebody if you don't believe what they say? I will come again and receive you unto myself. There was something going on in Peter's mind like he couldn't fit together. So why trust someone that you don't believe? doesn't make sense. I mean, God is telling us, do trust me, because you can believe and know that I will do what I say. So we become agitated because we don't believe in what God, we have doubts about what God is saying. So in some ways, Peter's mind was a little bit out of harmony with what Jesus was trying to tell him. And when you consider Proverbs 14, 12, it says that there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So the people who think they have a way to do things, it's the way of death, though, because it's not in harmony with God's word. They've not accepted God's word. They've said, I'm going to do it this way, because I think this is better. For whatever reason it may be. But God is saying, no, this is the way. Walk you in it. Um, but we can redeem the time, and we can overcome by God's grace. John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, we started, well, we didn't. Adam and Eve started in that state on top. We live in the state on bottom selfishness controlled by the three other things that are going on down there that's where we live but God wants to do something to us to bring us back into this state because you see the state down here is not in harmony with God but if we allow the Holy Spirit to direct us and by our choice of the will God can bring us into this frame of thought and practice and work. So, and it sort of makes sense in a little bit as I was going through this, why would anyone who lives in a selfish mode controlled by those three things there ever be happy in heaven? When heaven is the exact opposite of what's occurring down at the bottom. How would they ever be happy? If you were controlled by sensualism, like you were turned on by pretty girls, well, there's not going to be any turning on of pretty girls in heaven. There's no illicit relationships in heaven. It's all pure. Well, what if you're controlled by materialism? Well, there's not going to be any materialism in heaven. There will be material things, houses and lands and things, but... We're not going to be trying to build a bank account that has millions and billions of dollars. And if you're controlled by ego, look at me. Well, God himself is the most unegocentric being in the whole universe. If there's anyone who is the anti-whatever of selfishness, it is God. He is the most unselfish person. In fact, it is unselfishness that rules heaven. We call that love who lives for the benefit of others 100%, 24-7, 365, all the time. These people down here don't live for the benefit of others. They live for the benefit of themselves, 24-7. I think that's probably why God could say in Genesis chapter 5, 6, wherever the flood was, the thoughts of man were evil continually. Because all they could think about was themselves. That's evil. Thinking about self is evil. It's sin. Because God is not evil. He only thinks of others. He wants to get that character reflected in us so that we may share it with others. And that is the spirit that will rule heaven. The one on top, not the one on the bottom. <clears throat> so God is trying to bring us into that top environment. Now, let's think about how to do that. Okay? 
So let's, let's move on here. We're almost, we're almost there. So we want to be brought back into harmony with God. We must learn to trust in His Word and not rely on a conscience that is not enlightened by the Holy Spirit. The Scriptures are the foundation for all right decisions. Any inclinations, desires, or tendencies that are not in harmony with the Word of God are not the product of a sanctified conscience. I'm pretty sure that's a quote. Oh, actually, I think that's a quote out of Advent World by Neil Wilson. Um, and this is why the Bible study is so important. When we study the Bible, we read the Bible, the Holy Spirit talks to us in our, through our conscience. We're like, oh, yeah, I've read that. The very thought that comes in, we're like, that agrees to what I read in the Bible. We can then know that impression is coming from God. Yeah. Because I've read it. That's a way to verify, check and balance. The impressions. We get impressions all the time. And we're like, well, is that from God or where? Well, we need to study our Bible more. Because as we study our Bible more, we'll understand, oh, that impression's from God. Because that agrees with what I read. And we won't have to doubt. Is that from God or is that not from God? You won't have to guess because we've read it. If we don't read it, it could lead us to confusion. Well, it could be God. Yeah, that sounds like God. Okay. Well, we could be moving around in the feeling and thought mode versus the higher level mode. So it's, it's very important. So... So let's, let's go with Martin Luther just for a moment here, because he can give us, he gives us a good example of where God would like to bring us to. And so Martin Luther, the start of the Reformation, he had two central beliefs that, that he argued from. He was sola scriptura, the Bible alone is the sole rule, rule of faith and practice, and then human beings are saved by faith and not of works. So, based on this, when Luther took his famous stand at the Diet of Worms, he based his actions and informed his personal conscience, scripture, not on traditions, culture, or personal opinion. So when he stood before these church leaders, civil um, individuals, he was only going to approach what was out of the scriptures. He was not going to go off of what he thought, what he believed, what was in his best interest. He only presented what was in the Bible. And so here's a quote. Unless, therefore, I am convinced by the testimony of scripture or by the clearest reasoning, unless I am persuaded by means of the passages I have quoted, and unless they thus render my conscience bound by the word of God. Now, remember that. Render my conscience bound by the word of God. His conscience was bound by the word of God. Because to some level, Luther must have understood that the heart was deceitful and wicked above all things. Who can know it? Can I really trust it? The thing Luther understood that he could trust was the word of God, which is where God wants to bring us to trust in the word of God solely, not in our own self because we are flawed we are flawed individuals we are born into selfishness and God is trying to bring us up to a higher level of, ex of uh, practice and belief so he says, render my conscience bound by the word of God I cannot and I will not retract for it is unsafe for a Christian to speak against his conscience he goes on to say do not offer violence to my conscience, which is bound and changed, chained up with the Holy Scriptures. So Martin Luther was convicted that the Bible was right. And that's where he wanted his mind to be set. And he would not change his mind unless it was based on sound reasoning from out of Scripture. So Martin Luther use the scriptures to inform his conscience. 
of what it should believe, not his conscience informing scripture what to believe. There's a difference in that path and the definitely in the outcome of what occurs. So he used scripture to inform his conscience and his actions. And this is what God would like for us to do. So Martin Luther started the Reformation based on solo scriptura was going to be the rule. We are in that we are in that same reformation today that Martin Luther started. And so the very thing that God was able to accomplish in the life of Martin Luther he wants to accomplish in our life today. He wants to bring us in harmony with the top section of this board before he comes back. Because if he if he's not able to, then it's not because he doesn't try. It's because we refuse it. It's that will thing going there. We reject it. Because if we're if he's not able to take us from the bottom part of the board to the top part of the board, we aren't going to be able to go home with him. And he desperately wants to get us to the top part of the board. That's where he wants us to be. And if we allow him, he can get us there. And the same conviction that he gave Martin Luther, he can give to us in these last days that we will stand on the Bible only and we will not be moved. And we won't have to be wishy-washy about what we believe. We'll have the Bible. The Bible tells us. And we will be convicted and we shall not be moved. So, we're going to sing our closing.